This little video teaches you about the history of microscopes, properly called microscopy, which actually means the use of microscopes. You're expected to make your own notes from this and from the subsequent videos dealing with microscopes. So I suggest you pause the video, get your notebook and pen, and also get your textbook. And you can use your textbook and refer to it during the course of this video. The first recorded history that we have of microscopes is actually in the first century AD. And what we have recorded there is the use of a magnifying lens. Now the way that a lens works is it simply bends the light. We call this refraction. So it changes the direction in which light moves. Here you can see these water droplets on a stem that have actually refracted, in other words, bent the light. And so you can see a full picture or a full image of what is actually in front of the stem, even though you're not looking at it directly. So that's, that's what lenses do. Now, the first use that we have uh, of this, as I say, in the first century, is the use of crystals for focusing light to start fires and of uh, crystals also to help make things larger, to magnify things. Here's an example of water droplets being used as magnifiers for text. Now, it doesn't magnify terribly much, but you can see that the letters in the droplets are slightly bigger than those on the outside of the drops. This principle of refraction is used in the way that glasses are made, spectacles. And around the 1200s, so in the 13th century, we start to see the uh, appearance of, sp of spectacles, various quality spectacles, and also later on of something called flea glasses, which were simple lenses placed inside an optical tube or a tube to be able to view fleas, of all things. And that would give you about a 10 times magnification. So those were things were called simple lenses. Uh, oh, lost my pointer. Okay, so those are simple microscopes. They have a single lens. Okay, and that's around about, as I said, the 13th century, so 1200s. The next time that we see anything to do with lenses is in the late 1500s, 1595 you can see there. And in 1595 there were two Dutch gentlemen called Janssen and Lippershey. And Janssen and Lippershey were the first people to develop a compound microscope. Now compound means that you have more than one lens in sequence. So inside this tube, they would have two lenses, and they experimented with that. Unfortunately, their experiment wasn't really a success because they didn't yet have sufficiently high-quality techniques in terms of producing the lenses, so the grinding, the cutting, the polishing. They weren't very good at that, and so the quality of their microscope wasn't very good as a result. Shortly thereafter, however, Galileo appears on the scene, and Galileo produces this version. Where are we? There we go. Galileo. And that was in 1609. So in 1609, Galileo produces a telescope, uh, which has a very simple focusing device on it. And the way that he does that is that he has one concave and one convex lens. Now, concave, if the light is coming this way, concave is that shape. If it's convex and the light is coming this way, it's that way. The way to remember it is that your cave goes in. In 1624, he produces this beautiful uh, microscope here. And that was a very successful microscope because Galileo had uh, worked on the technique of how to develop the lens. And as a result, the quality of his microscope was very good and you were able to see stars and planets and all that sort of thing, which is how he was then essentially a microscope and a telescope are the same thing. Uh, they just work on different scales. And... Uh, he was able to see stars and all kinds of interesting things, which is one of the reasons that he's very famous. This microscope is developed shortly thereafter in 1665. And this is developed by a man named Robert Hooke. 
Now, Robert Hooke was the first person to ever see cells, and the reason he was able to see cells is because he further developed the techniques of producing the lenses that go inside this tube. Okay. Notice, though, that the illumination, in other words, the way that we light the object you're looking at, is still from the outside, shining onto the object. There's a pin, and your object would sit here. It shines onto the object and reflects off the object up the tube uh, up to here, which is where your eye would then have a look at it. Okay, So that was Robert Hooke. As I say, he was very important because he's the first person to have seen cells. In fact, he coined the term cell. He came up with that word. This is what his microscope looks like. Now, this is a museum specimen, um, or museum model, rather, built according to his designs. It's not the actual one that he produced. But this is what he saw when he looked down the microscope. Now, you will, I'm sure, all know what cork is. Uh, in a wine bottle. Cork is actually a tree. What you put into the wine bottle to, as a sort of lid or to stopper it is the bark of the cork tree. And what he saw were in fact cork cells. He took some of the, the tissue and he looked at it. Notice all the little squares. The reason that he came up with the term cells is that each little square reminded him of a monk's room in a monastery. A teeny tiny little square area in which there is a bed and nothing else. And if you look at these squares it looks like there isn't much inside them. And they're teeny tiny squares. And so he used the word cell, which means little box or little room. Okay, so that's where he came up with the word cells. So Robert Hooke is very important because he's the first person to have seen cells. Next person, shortly, as I said, that was 1665. Shortly thereafter, in 1674, we have... And this is not him in the photo. Fun, oopsie, let me spell this correctly. Fun Liu and Hook. There we go. Anton von Leeuwenhoek. Hook. Now, von Leeuwenhoek Hook didn't use a compound microscope. Remember, compound has got two lenses. He used a simple microscope, but he developed a completely new technique for creating the lens and in fact it was only in the last hundred years or so that anybody was able to duplicate his mechanism because he refused to write it down he kept it a complete secret and it was only in the last hundred years or so that somebody well two or three different people at different times stumbled across the technique that they think he used to create his lenses his lenses were fabulous though even though they were a single uh, lens if you remember at the beginning uh, Janssen and uh, Lippershey's compound microscope they were only, the, just before that, the simple microscopes that they used were only able to produce 10 times magnification. These are able to produce 250 times magnification. Still a simple, simple lens. This area here is where the lens goes. And what he did, what we think he did, was to pull glass into a long strand and then split that strand and use the half of the strand to then turn it into little, uh, if you like, drops of glass and that would be placed in that hole. On the tip of this pin, that is where you would put your object, and then as you can see in the photograph from that gentleman who is modeling it for us, you would hold it up to your eye and allow the light to shine from behind. Now, using this obviously takes a lot of time and a lot of patience. Yet, with it, uh, Van Leeuwenhoek was able to draw this. This is a section, a cross-section or a transsection of a stem. And as you can see, the amount of detail that he was able to see is phenomenal. Uh, I bet that many of you do not have observation skills half as good as Van Leeuwenhoek had. So this is a simple uh, microscope with a 250 times magnification, and this is what he's able to draw. Van Leeuwenhoek, despite the fact that he's using a simple microscope rather than a compound microscope, is termed the father of microscopy. And the reason for that is that he's the first person to have viewed red blood cells, in their capillary, busy flowing, and he's also the first person to have seen organisms in drops of water. Usually pond water. Which we now obviously call microorganisms. And for that reason, because he popularized popular popularized, there we go, uh, this whole thing of microscopy, he is termed the father of microscopy. So those things, uh, the first micro, the these microorganisms he saw in 17, sorry, in 1676.
After that, uh, there's very little change in microscopes. So most people continue with the compound microscope until suddenly we see this kind of thing in the early 1900s, late 1800s, early 1900s. So how do we get from uh, Hooke's compound microscope and von Leeuwenhoek's simple microscope to this? Well, there's a gentleman called August Kohler. And in 1893, he developed two very important features on a microscope. This bottom one is called the condenser. And the top one is the diaphragm. Both of those are responsible for changing the amount of light that shines on an object. Uh, changing the light. That little triangle, by the way, is the physical symbol for change. Uh, changing the light. And as a result, he also changed the way that light is used. In the previous ones, if you look at Hooke's microscope, the light shines onto the object and is reflected off the object. Whereas here, the light is transmitted through the object. And that's a huge difference. As a result, this technique is called cooler or Kohler uh, illumination. So the light is produced down here. It shines up through the condenser, through the diaphragm, through whatever sample you've got lying on the top here, through these lenses and up out the top to where your eye is. And that's a big difference. The result of that, uh, with further modifications and developments, is that uh, Charles Spencer in the mid to late 1800s was able to produce microscopes that could magnify 1,250 times just using ordinary light, which is pretty phenomenal. But microscope development didn't stop there. It's continued. This is the next generation of microscopes. Uh, <coughs> first one is called a transmitting or transmission electron microscope. And what that does is scope. What that does is instead of uh, shining electrons through or transmitting electrons through the sample, uh, sorry, light through the sample, it transmits electrons. And those electrons, when they come through on the other side, will then hit a photographic plate, which can then be developed to produce your image. So this is your TEM. And this was developed by uh, a gentleman called Ernst Rusker. And that was in the early 1900s. This, however, the image that you can see here, this is what's called a scanning electron microscope, which is a development, if you like, one step up from the transmission electron microscope. Uh, this is called SEM for short. Now, the scanning electron microscope was developed by Max Knoll, and this was in 1935. And what's amazing about this is that this has, on average, a half a million times magnification. If you've got a really specialized one, you can actually get it up to a million times magnification, which means that you can actually see atoms. You can s see the diameter of atoms. Uh, so that's a, a, a pretty big one. The, the other main difference between the scanning electron microscope and the transmission electron microscope as I said, the transmission one, it shines a beam of electrons through the object. Very similar to the light microscope, except you're sending electrons instead of light. The scanning electron microscope bounces electrons off, so it reflects electrons off your sample. doesn't send them through the sample. Uh, same principle, though. Those bounced electrons or reflected electrons then hit a photographic plate, and we produce an image from that. This is one such image. It's a nerve ending. The colors are artificial. Those are added for clarity for you to be able to identify features. But that's what a nerve ending looks like using a scanning electron microscope. These are three other mis microscopes that have been produced um, since then in the late, well, late 1970s and 1980s. This one, the acoustic mi microscope, uses sound in the same way that echolocation does. The confocal uses fluorescence. Fluore and the scanning probe microscope actually physically touches the object and develops it through that. So that's the development of microscopes.